All right. Well, thank you both so much. That was super, super interesting. I appreciated it. Um, it looks like questions may still be coming in. So um, I may ask a quick question as people are, are thinking of some. Um, first one would be, uh, you talked a little bit about a new monitoring project that is, is kind of coming online. And, and I wonder if you, either of you could talk a little bit more about maybe uh, what, what are some of the things you're hoping to, to look at in terms of inter new or different intervention practices or uh, just the kind of data that you're gonna be collecting in that project? Yeah, I, am, I can kind of start out and then join in Shannon as you'd like. Um, so this is really an exciting project because it's combining expertise. We've worked independently in these spaces for a lot of years. And so now we finally have the chance to, to um, work together. So uh, we'll actually continue monitoring the Shell Creek watershed and the Black Hawk Lake watershed. Um, and then we'll do consistent analysis across the two watersheds. So we'll do uh, the DNA extraction and the high throughput qPCR. Um, and then we'll do a, a common suite of um, antibiotic analyses. Uh, and Diana Aga at the University of Buffalo has been doing a lot of work looking at the antibiotics as well as their metabolites. So how do these antibiotics break down in the environment? What are the you know, potential consequences and some, you know, some of these uh, metabolites may be even just as um, uh, complex and, and of a concern as some of the, the parent compounds. Um, and then this also brings in the expertise at uh, UNL of um, Amy Schmidt has a huge extension program. Um, Dan Anderson at Iowa State also has a huge extension program. So really getting this information out to um, farmers and producers. And this is one of our first efforts to do that. Um, and then Bing Wang is going to help us with risk assessment. So, you know, kind of that so what piece. There's so much information that's starting to come out um, from researchers and EPA about the presence of these resistant genes and organisms. But uh, connecting that to a true risk to public health is a really big challenge. And so um, Bing Wang Bing's expertise in that risk assessment, and she's going to be working on that. Awesome. Sounds great. Well, it looks like we do have one uh, question so far uh, from Wesley. Uh, how wide were the vegetative strips in the prairie strips question or project? Yeah, so um, goodness, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer that. Uh, for the um, experiments that uh, we did, the prairie strips were about a meter wide. So um, that gave us, uh, it was a, a meter. Um, length of cropped area and then an equal length of prairie strip. So, um, you know, of course, that's a very small scale that we're working for these runoff studies. And then the prairie strips can be designed based upon kind of the hydrology of the system and the area that's contributing. So the, the prairie strips actual um, width in the field would be determined based on the, the site conditions. Um. I would say same in our study of the narrow grass hedges uh, for the swine manure application. Our field study, um, they were about two feet, about 0.7 meters. Um, and again, the I think the idea though is that you can have a relatively narrow um, intervention buffer strip that can still create um, quite a bit of improvement or mitigation for both antibiotics or AMR. Yeah, and I can add for our prairie strip experiments um, that intense rainfall intensity was pretty high, uh, three inches per hour. Um, and so even though the area contributing wasn't that large, we did try to have a pretty intense event to, you know, wouldn't be a worst case scenario, but it would be a pretty um, intense type of rainfall event. Yeah, it's good to hear. I did want to ask uh, on that. I the one where you talked about you split up the the sediment versus the water um and do you have um information like off the top of your head if on like what those differences were in terms of where where we were finding the stuff yeah um i i do i do know that we're seeing a lot of this uh stain suspended in the water 
Um, and so that is why these practices that enhance infiltration and actually can reduce the overall runoff do seem to be perhaps a little bit more effective. Um, and, and, and we've done some column experiments as well. So we kind of take a core of soil and then we apply the manure or the water to the top of that column. And again, we're, we are seeing movement through the macro pores and through the soil profile. So um, yeah, and that hopefully will be coming out in more detail soon. We don't have that published yet, but um, I was kind of surprised. I'd actually expected the bacteria to be sorbing to the sediment and moving in the suspended state, but we, we have generally seen the opposite. Interesting. Well, thank you. Oh, it looks like we have another question. Um, one of the big challenges that you mentioned is deciding which target to measure. Yeah, very important. Can you talk a little bit more about which targets you have chosen to measure and if you plan any changes for the upcoming experiments? I guess I can start on this um, from the AMR perspective and then Shannon can hop on with the antibiotics. But um, yeah, so you know, we have had the chance to, uh, using the, the high throughput qPCR measure a lot of different targets, but our uh, limit of detection is higher than with uh, kind of a more standard qPCR where you look at it gene by gene. And so there's pros and cons of all of these different technologies. Um, and so the, the targets that we have measured um, in the past uh, using kind of the, the deeper methods, the qPCR have been um, ERMB, um, ERMF, uh, TETM. Those seem to be kind of some of the, the workhorses or the genes that we can generally detect because when we're looking at, you know, the type of monitoring we do is pretty intense in, in space and time. And so, uh, we, if we can find genes that kind of tend to be detectable, then we can get a better understanding of their environmental movement and patterns. And so those are some that we have um, used pretty consistently. Um, and another reason we use those is because um, we do have through uh, Dan Anderson's um, extension program, we're able to kind of get senses for what type of antibiotics are being used and what we can detect in manures. And we do still see uh, some macrolide use, um, TMULIN, um, um, probably less uh, tylosin that we than we had seen in the past. Um, and we do still detect a, quite a bit of tetracycline. Um, and so that has really been our emphasis is the knowing about the use of these antibiotics and then uh, trying to find those genes that um, for the most part are able to kind of relate to those. Um, so EPA has been doing some really interesting uh, monitoring of AMR across the country. And so we are definitely looking at the genes that they have been detecting at a larger scale and kind of reassessing to see if some of those should be added to um, the samples that we've been collecting. And so Shannon, do you wanna talk about the um, antibiotic piece? Yeah, yeah. And I think um, in the current study, I think still focusing largely on antibiotic classes that are predominantly used in um, animal agriculture, which I think is really important. I was just going to add, as we try to have also kind of a sort of a one health perspective, we're also trying to expand to looking at some of the antibiotic classes that are more commonly used in human medicine. And so if we're adding in new classes, looking more at like cephalosporins, um, beta-lactam, um, and I think there's a lot of work that we can do looking at some of the traditional indicators of resistance, but then also trying to look at um, um, resistant organisms that may be resistant to some of the antibiotic classes that are used more for human, um, human medicine and trying to kind of make that connection between animal systems and human systems. And that I think is a really underexplored area currently. So I think there's a lot of work that can be done there. Uh, we got a question from Carlton on the prairie strip experiment. Um, 
uh, you displayed the heat map uh, for the ARGs. Um, did you collect data to also uh, show differences in the bacterial community before and after, and so you could potentially uh, correlate uh, with the genes that you found? Um, yeah, this has uh, been much of the work that Adina Howe has done on this project, but we, uh, we did um, assess the microbial. So we, we got the sample sequenced and did look at the microbial community. Um, and I know that we saw differences, um, you know, among those different compartments. So the uh, soil samples were different than the water samples, um, which were different than the manure samples. Um, and, but I don't think we have uh, tried to um, correlate with the specific genes that we had detected. Um, I can look into that a little bit more and try to do a follow-up answer if we did. All right, thank you. I would like to just thank everybody for joining us today and especially to our speakers um, for sharing um, about what they've learned so far and, and looking forward to what is going to be coming out on this topic in the future. So thank you all and please come back for future webinars.